Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got some big energies coming, a big window of energy. Can't wait to show you this material. We've got a little bit of history. We have a lot of alignments to go over and a big, powerful week. Uh, did I say week? Big, powerful three and a half weeks of Gold Rush. That's the name of this energy. I'll show you exactly why. It's much more than just having some Taurus planets and whatnot, even a new moon in there. It's much more than that. So, let's see, it's time to start looking at this playbook. I'm gonna zoom in. We're looking at energy shift number eight. Welcome to another energy shift video. In this video, we're looking at the window between April 19th and May 23rd. The biggest alignment here that spans this entire period is on the 20th of April at 9.27 a.m. Jupiter and Uranus come together in Taurus. And I'll show you what history shows about this. That It's an amazing alignment. And that's just the beginning of our bullish activity in Taurus. But I'm naming this the 2024 Gold Rush. And uh, we'll go all the way through it. Uh, I got a lot of material to, sh to uh, show you. And I mean, it better be a lot because it's a big period of time. I mean, we didn't normally have these little short packets of archetypical images. There's just too much here. And here's our list. All right. We have... Act one of our uh, window, curtains open at 9 a.m. on the 19th of April. And this is when the sun enters Taurus. And when it does so, it squares over to Pluto. I'm going to show you this in the, in the image above in the chart. But it's a tight two-degree orb. And that has an energetic signature. And then we already have in Taurus... Jupiter and Uranus already conjunct at the time of this video is being recorded on the 18th of March. So this actually started on March 2nd, the energy of Jupiter and Uranus conjunct, um, and we'll keep going until June 5th. All right. So that's a three month period, but it c comes to a perfected conjunction at 927 PM on the 20th, 420. Um, and then Sun square Pluto will go exact uh, on the 21st. Then on the 23rd, we have a full moon in Scorpio with a Pluto T-square. T then we have Mars passing over Neptune. This is probably the last time we'll talk about this, but that's an important one because during Act 1 especially, Mars, your ability to get stuff done, is passing over the tricky and illusions and fantasy of Neptune. And so yeah, that, that can make it very difficult to act appropriately or act in accordance with something rational, uh, just makes it hard. Then in act two, we're going to get an extra dose of Taurus. If we didn't have uh, enough already with sun entering Taurus and Jupiter and Uranus is already there in act two starts on the 29th of April. And that's when Venus enters Taurus. Now Venus is the ruler of Taurus um, and she's going to end up in that Pluto T, uh, Pluto square as well. And so that same energetic footprint of a planet going, a big planet going into Taurus gets that face full of Pluto as uh, he and she, Sun and Venus, do that separately. But it creates a very strong fixed Earth backdrop. So that's the difference in Act 2. We have the backdrop signature turns fixed earth and it gets very strong and it gets even stronger when the new moon happens on the 7th of May. So that's why we continue to feel this energetic imprint. And the other reason is because Jupiter and Uranus are two pretty slow planets. So that conjunction lasts a lot longer. The curtains ultimately close on the 23rd of May. And this is due to the Venus and sun leaving Taurus, and then we'll have an, another energy to talk about after that. But this is a long window from the 19th of April to the 23rd of May. Now, let me show you this chart is of the 20th of April at 920, 
7 Central Daylight Savings Time. Um, and this is when Jupiter and Uranus are perfectly conjunct. So we have this is one of the energies we're going to read, but I'm going to show you the history of that. So I'm going to hold off on that. But we have the sun just went into Taurus. So that is its own archetype. Could be the gardener. So I had a picture of the uh, the gardener. Could be the bull plodding along at a steady pace, unhurried, yet making progress. And this sun going into Taurus means that we might feel pursuit of simple pleasures, maybe good food, beauty, nature. And we might feel patient and determined and working towards goals and might feel a strong connection to earth and nature. Some other archetypes that we might feel just with sun going into Taurus and the other two planets there doing its thing. We have the loyal companion. We might have the vineyard owner tending the vines, savoring the harvest of grapes that will become fine wine. It's a very apropos image. Um, we might be feeling appreciation of quality over quantity during this period of time. Pursuit of comfort, beauty, and reliable security. Financial savvy and responsible money management is also appropriate. Okay, so now you see that when the sun enters Taurus, immediately hits a face full of hard aspect over to Pluto, who is still in Aquarius. So what does that energy feel like? Well, it could be the immovable object, like an unstoppable force colliding with an immovable object, or a bull in a china shop. I really like this one a lot especially because Sun and Taurus, we have the bowl and we have the China. It's of value. And ironically, I want all the China, but I'm breaking it all because I can't control myself. Or I also like the pressure cooker. This is why I have the image here of the pressure cooker is building up intense heat and pressure. This is coming from Pluto, square to Pluto, and eventually erupting if unchecked. And so this square energy could be felt as a um, clashing of values, power struggles, particularly around possessions, could have a deep transformation of financial habits or self-worth. Uh, we could have repressed passions exploding to the surface, uh, compulsive overindulgence in pleasures to excess. And then that leads us to probably the biggest of them all, Uranus and Jupiter. And I'm going to show you a little bit of what history has to say about this alignment because it's been many decades since the last time we saw Jupiter and Uranus together in Taurus. But this energy alone could be akin to the jackpot winner, land, uh, landing a life-changing windfall or a stroke of amazingly good luck. It could be a light bulb moment. U uh, Uranus, being the flash of genius and inspiration that lights up bold new possibilities. Uh, but what I'm going with today in making this case is the gold rush, the archetypical gold rush, rushing toward new horizons and prosperity like prospectors chasing the gold rush. So this energy, as you'll see, including from history, shows sudden financial gains or growth in resources, new innovation in business banking or money management, opportunities arising out of the blue. How about disruption of routines for exciting new adventures, interest in breakthrough technology because Uranus is there with representing electricity and, and uh, technology, experimenting with alternative approaches to increasing wealth. And that leads us to our picture, our gold rush picture. And now I wanted to go, you know, look at our history. So let's look at the last time Taurus had Jupiter and Uranus coming together in that sign of Taurus. That was May of 1941. What was happening in May 1941. Well, there was basically a war 
literally a war on gold. Um, all through the 30s, mid 30s to the early 40s, Nazis were basically invading countries. And uh, by the way, I, I'm I need to tell you that I'm not going to be financially advising you, although it's going to sound like it. I'm not making any particular pitch. I just want to show you what history says about Jupiter and Uranus conjunct in Taurus, okay? And I'm not making any inferences about what prices might do and all that. But this is, and I'm not a historian, but this is the what my research showed. All right, so we have... Uh, from what I can gather, Nazis are invading countries, especially in Europe, and taking their gold. Well, we have another country that is also stealing gold. I say, yes, I said stealing. This is the United States with the Gold Reserve Act. That was in 1933, apparently. The executive order made it a criminal offense for U.S. citizens to own or trade gold anywhere in the world with exceptions of some jewelry and collector's coins. Now, this is important, too, for later. 1964 is when they started to relax this prohibition of gold. All right, so you can imagine. Now, this is an inference, right? Around 1940, 41, it's been about seven years into this illegality. You can imagine how many masses of people are going to try and hide their gold and refuse to just hand it over like they were mandated to do. Um, they were having a massive amount of lawfare specifically for gold ownership or precious metal. I, I don't know if that included silver or not, but or if it was just specific to gold. But they pegged it at a troy ounce of $35. I'm going to show you that chart later. But the point is, here in the United States, United States was stealing gold or prohibiting us from owning it, Right. And then you had the Nazis that were stealing it from other people. In 1941, as this last Jupiter-Uranus in Taurus was happening, Nazis, okay, so the Soviet Union, the, so the Nazis had their eye on the Soviet Union. Soviet Union caught wind of it, apparently, started taking their masses of gold and moving it around their countries in order to hide it from the Nazis. And the Nazis were doing everything they could to go find it. So it's like this massive push for gold, both in the United States uh, and elsewhere. And I even have another document that I found. This is Switzerland and the gold transactions in the Second World War. This it says specifically in here, in 1941, Swiss gold in the United States was frozen and thereby rendered almost useless. So there was an all out war, mainly in US, Europe and the Nazis and Soviet Union in 1941, a war on gold. I had no idea all this stuff took place, but uh, was astounded when I found it. All right. So now then I'm like, well, now I'm really interested to when was the last time Jupiter and Uranus were in Taurus? And I found that to be May of 1858. May 1858 uh, was the Pikes Peak <laughs> Denver gold rush. And that's when it began. It's uh, I found that in in this document. And this was within a month and a half the gold rush actually begins in uh, July 1858. The conjunction of Jupiter and Uranus in Taurus was happening at the end of May. So like within a month and a half, this gold rush is starting, right? So it's confirmed by two periods of time with Jupiter and Uranus coming together in Taurus. Then I'm like, what are all the other indicators. Well, what are the financial signs? Does this gold rush thing happen when um, when Jupiter and Uranus come together in, say, Aquarius? There doesn't seem to be much data on that. But what about Libra? Because Libra is a financial sign. So I looked at that. Last time uh, Uranus and Jupiter were in, Taurus, uh, in Libra was... December 
of 1968. What do we have there? Well, look at this. We have the Gold Control Act of 1968. And when it goes into uh, commi commenced, and um, see if I can zoom in on this. It's 1 September 1968. The actual conjunction was a little bit later, but it was, it's within the technical eight degree orb conjunction. So this Gold Control Act, basically in India, as the U.S. is relaxing their gold possession laws, India is actually saying uh, starting it. So it, let's see here, it in uh, 24 August 1968, which prohibited citizens from owning gold in one f in the form of bars and coins. So here we go again. And this is interesting because it's in Libras, but you can't say it's one or the other. Uh, they're relaxing um, possession because the U.S. is relaxing, but India is increasing their, I don't know, laws against it, banning it. And you're not allowed to trade and all that. So there's just these big, um, I don't know, the, both justices and injustices. So it's, it does. It, it matches the Libra uh, thing, the li Libra energy of this. All right. So let's move on. I just thought that was incredible. Then I have a chart, historical gold. And again, I, I caution you, I'm not, you know, creating any, um, thing here. I just want to show you pretty quick here. 1968 is remember 1968 is the last time, um, Jupiter and Uranus were together in Libra. That's when this is the price of gold. This is, first of all, this line here is when the U S government had, uh, pegged it peg gold to like 30, I don't know, 30, it says $35 here. And then they start relaxing ownership and it starts to go up immediately. And that catalyzed when it was in, when the conjunction happened in Libra. Then we look at, um, two, 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 two. what was the next big date? Um, I want to look in Sagittarius was in 83 and that's happening right about in here. Um, this is a, an, an adjusted for logarithmic, this is a logarithmic scale, but not inflation adjusted. If you go into this chart, and I'll put this link in, in here uh, so you can peruse it, but 1980 and 83, or 80 and 81 is when we had this inflation adjusted high peak. But when you do the non-inflation adjusted, it just looks like it holds steady. Another important one is 1411. So 2011 is right there. This is when, um, right here at this peak, this is when Uranus and Jupiter were together in Pisces. Um, and then now we have back to uh, Taurus. So... I can't tell you if gold price or what it's going to do based on this gold rush, but all I can say is the energy of this is commensurate with the gold rush. So we're looking at, at things of value, material possessions going forward, especially in this time frame. All right, really quick, I want to go through the variety of charts. Now, we already looked at the original chart that starts our window but shortly later, 23 April, we have a Scorpio full moon. The Act 1 period, the first part of our window, is has a lot of Scorpio in it. It has a Scorpio full moon, a T-square on Pluto, and a signature uh, back here. But you can't ignore what's happening in Taurus. And that's why we have basically Act 1 is more of... A, a combination of Taurus and Scorpio. So you have an obsession of obsessiveness, a ruminating kind of a thing, maybe even a bitterness associated with this gold rush, but you definitely have the Taurian um, 
prospecting and all that. So there's a mish, m- mismatch, um, it's a meshing of all that. All right. Then on the 29th of April, uh, things get a lot more Taurians. You have Venus, who is the ruler of Taurus, goes into Taurus. And now we have a, an official. This is Act Two. This makes it the signature go from um, Scorpio into Taurus, fixed Earth. And so we have the ruler there. We have a square over to Pluto, making a much more... Um, this is our re- last remaining Scorpio Ness energetic imprint on this. So we have a signature of Taurus. We have the ruler of Taurus in here. We have the pressure cooker of Pluto. And then it just accelerates from there. Now look, we have a new moon on the 7th of May at 10, 22 PM. We have a new moon at 18 degrees, two minutes, and look at this fixed earth is six fixed and five earths. So it's a mega Torian imprint here and it's a new moon cycle. So on seven May, it's no wonder that this energy stays until the 23rd. And basically we're going to see Venus transit the entire space of Taurus and then leave. And once she leaves on the 23rd of May, that's when this window closes. So we have two different acts all the whole window has this Pluto <clears throat> and Scorpio kind of influence, but that doesn't dominate. The dominating is Taurus and the gold rush. All right, now let's go back to the original chart, the playbook, and let's read the summary for this is good for this entire period. Although this energetic window takes a while to fully develop, perfect for Taurus, right? It packs a big Taurian punch and and the entire time from the onset. On April 19th, the sun enters Taurus and the collective is injected with hard work, stability, loyalty, sensory indulgence, and a strong connection to nature. But these Taurian influences are muddied and mixed with harsh Plutonian power struggles, obsessions, jealousies, headbutts, and general clashes This powerful Pluto pressure is multiplied by a Scorpio full moon and seeks an outlet, which will be the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. The energy is akin to a New Age gold rush, where people pour all their Taurus grit into dedicated actions, hoping, hoping to find amazing value, worth, and other valuable resources. They're basically trying to develop wealth. Imagine the energies of the 1848 and 1858 gold rushes as promises of unbelievable wealth are painted into people's minds. The felt inner expansiveness is obsessive and motivating, but this obsessive hope doesn't guarantee success in finding the valuable nuggets. Imagine now you're moving out with a caravan out to California, and I hear You know, that one and the Pikes Peak um, gold rush was amazing. And seeing these long lines of of caravans as people going out to California. But uh, imagine getting out there only to find that everyone else is already out there with their hurried demeanor, trying to find the the riches. You know, you get their the pans are out there in the creek and they're already there and you haven't even set up your camp yet. Hurry up and get your pans into the creek. The Pluto square adds this pressure and conflict. We perceive that everyone else is also competing for the same hidden and valuable items. Welcome to the 2024 gold rush. And um, I think all the things that we looked at in history, including the big 1941 push, I mean, who's ever heard of it? Anybody heard of this where the Nazis were basically stealing gold. And they said in that article that they were stealing the gold to fund their war effort and, you know, pay for other things. But uh, apparently then other uh, suppliers or countries that were supplying them with the resources for war started to refuse taking their gold as collateral. So anyway, it's, it was all about gold and hiding it and trying to steal it. And the U S government was doing it Two, hope I don't get banned for that. All right, let's look at the yin yang meter. 
Um, we see that it's highly more yang. Taurus is a feminine energy. So I think it'd be more of a yin, but I think with that pressure cooker concept and that square over to Pluto um, makes this a very motivating. And when you talk about anything motivating, um, also the expansiveness of Jupiter with Uranus together, I think that's also going to play into it. But there's also this, um, it's not completely yang. I wouldn't say that because there's this spontaneity that, um, that both Uranus and Jupiter evoke. And, um, I think that's representative of this, you know, kind of hope and, um, thinking the best case. And, you know, just think about going before you go out to California on the gold rush, gold rush, what's painted in your mind. That's the Jupiter Uranus influence, particularly in Taurus. It's the hope for it. It's like convincing you that, Oh my God, it's going to be amazing. And then the Pluto influence is you've, you've, you've gone out there now to look for your gold only to find everyone else is there too. And so there's this power struggle and assuming that everyone's against you, that kind of Scorpio, the dark side it could be there as well. All right, here's the playbook. What do you guys think about this period? Did I get it right? I'm astounded by the history of the gold rushes and the connection, the correlation between Jupiter and Uranus in Taurus with the news, particularly around gold and what everyone's doing during those times. Crazy. All right. Let me know what you guys think. Thanks for all your support. And we'll see you in the next video. Take care.